We're in chapter 30 here in the book of Ezekiel. And as we've been going through the book of Ezekiel, we've seen that uh, the Lord is speaking, especially in the last several chapters, uh, he, he is speaking concerning judgment. So let's begin in chapter 30 at uh, verse 1. I'll read verses 1 through 5, and we'll continue our study here in Ezekiel. And we're going to be looking at, at God as he's pronouncing judgment on the nation of Egypt. So chapter 30, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 5. The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord God, Wail, woe to the day, for the day is near. Even the day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, the time of the Gentiles. The sword shall come upon Egypt, and great anguish shall be in Ethiopia when the slain fall in Egypt, and they take away her wealth, and her foundations are broken down. Ethiopia, Libya, Lydia, all the mingled people, Chub, and the men of the lands who are allied shall fall with them by the sword. Now, as we've been going through Ezekiel, especially in the last few chapters, Ezekiel has been giving a word of, of future judgment. And he's speaking concerning judgment that's coming upon many people. We've seen how he spoke of judgment coming upon the Ammonites and the Moabites and the Edomites. We've seen how he's spoken of judgment that's coming on the Philistines. He spoke of judgment that, were coming on, that was coming on cities, cities like, like Tyre and Sidon. And, and he is, in the last chapter into chapter 30, is now speaking concerning judgment that is falling on the nation of, of Egypt. Now, I mentioned to you that Egypt is a nation that introduced the Jews, basically introduced the Jews to idolatry. When they were there in captivity, the Egyptians were extreme idolaters, and, and I mentioned to you that they had really influenced the nation of Israel towards idolatry. And, and I also mentioned to you that when God began to bring deliverance to the children of Israel as they were about to leave the bondage of, of Egypt, how that God had brought a series of plagues and uh, he brought 10 plagues against the nation of, of Egypt. And uh, these plagues, according to Exodus chapter 12, verse 12, were against all the gods of Egypt. And so God had brought judgment on 10 specific uh, gods of Egypt. Uh, when he turned the Nile into blood, he was judging the fertility god of the Nile, which was depicted as a crocodile. When he brought the plague of frogs, he was bringing judgment against the frog-headed goddess of resurrection. When they suffered through the lice, that was judgment on the goddess of the sky. When he brought the uh, judgment through flies, they were blood-sucking flies, it brought judgment on the god, uh, an insect god. The judgment on livestock, livestock was the judgment of uh, Apis, who was uh, represented by a bull. The boils uh, represented the judgment on the goddess of pestilence. Uh, Hail was judging Geb because he was believed to be the god of the earth. The locusts were against Serapis, who was the god of the underworld. The, the darkness was against the sun god, Ra. And then the, the death of the firstborn of Pharaoh was because Pharaoh believed himself to be descended from the gods. And so what God said was, as I mentioned in Exodus 12, verse 12, against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And so that's what was taking place. The nation of Israel, as it had been in Egyptian bondage, had been brought into an idolatrous way of thinking. So when Israel left Egypt, Egypt never really left them. And so in their history, they were continually plagued by idolatry. Their hearts continually returned to Egypt. And even in their history, they would return to Egypt and ask for help from the Egyptians. Now, God is making it clear that he's going to judge Egypt. And he's making it clear that they will never once again be a world power. He had said in Ezekiel 29, verse 14, that they shall be a lowly kingdom. And so he's speaking judgment against Egypt. Now, he says in verse 2, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord God, Wail, woe to the day, for the day is near. Even the day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, the time of the Gentiles. 
So it's interesting how he speaks concerning this day. Notice verse 3, he speaks of it as being the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is near. Now, we, we see that term, it's found throughout the Bible. From the Old to the New Testament, it speaks concerning the day of the Lord. And when you see it, it it's, it's, it's a, speaking of a, a time of judgment that comes. Now, the term the day of the Lord is used in various ways in the Bible. In, in, in many cases, it speaks of a period of time that God brings judgment on the earth. It can also be called a day of wrath. It's called a day of visitation. It can be called the great day of God Almighty. It's a, it speaks of a day of judgment. Now, in one sense, when that phrase, the day of the Lord, is used, it, it's not speaking of a 24-hour day, a single day. It speaks of a period that God pours out His wrath on unbelievers of all kinds, including Israel, and you see that in the Old Testament. So sometimes when you read the term, the day of the Lord, you'll be thinking perhaps of that time. You see, Joel in chapter 1, verse 15 says, the day of the Lord is near, it will come like destruction from the Almighty. Or Amos in chapter 5, verses 18 through 20 says, woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion only to meet a bear, as though he entered his house, rested his hand on the wall, only to have a snake bite him. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light, pitch dark without a ray of brightness? And so this is a period of time in some context that speaks concerning the Lord pouring out his wrath and, and that's used as the day of the Lord. Now, in the New Testament, in, in Second uh, Thessalonians, uh, in chapter 2, it speaks concerning that this is a time when the Antichrist is revealed and, and he seats himself in the temple and expecting to be worshipped. And, and this is happening in this day of God, the day of the Lord. It's a period of time that very often is also spoken of as being the tribulation. Now, in this particular passage, the day of the Lord speaks of the soon judgment of Egypt. That judgment takes place in, in uh, 568 and 567, and it occurred through the uh, Babylonian invasion, and it is going to be completely fulfilled during the tribulation when all the nations come under judgment. But this particular judgment is the day of clouds. Now, when it speaks of it as being a day of clouds, it'll be a day of clouds, the time of the Gentiles, we need to remember that it seldom rained in Egypt, so, so the clouds would speak of a coming storm. So he's saying there's a coming storm that is coming. It is a time of judgment that I'm going to be pouring out on the nation of Egypt. Now, in verse 3, he also uses the phrase, the time of the Gentiles, which is interesting, and I'll touch on that for a moment, because there are two definitions that can explain this particular term as it's being used here. Well, one, when it speaks of the time of the Gentiles, it can speak of Egypt's defeat by Babylon because that was one of the events that led to the Gentile domination on earth. The times of the Gentiles is a long period beginning with the Babylonian captivity of Judah under Nebuchadnezzar and is brought to an end by the destruction of Gentile world power by the stone that's been cut out without hands, according to Daniel chapter 2, speaking of Jesus Christ, who's the Lord of glory. But it also speaks about events that are taking place at that time, a time when the Gentiles are coming into that period of rulership and God is saying that, that at this point here, this is when Babylon is going to reach its ascendancy. Now, it's interesting when it speaks of it. Notice verse 4. It says, The sword shall come upon Egypt, and great anguish shall be in Ethiopia when the slain fall in Egypt. And so there are going to be Gentile nations that are overcome by Babylon. That's the point he's making. But what I find is interesting. Notice how it says, uh, they will take away her wealth, her foundations are broken down. Ethiopia, Libya, Lydia, all the mingled people. Well, all the mingled people and all would be foreigners who are living in Egypt. These are other nations. But he also is bringing judgment on, on heavy people because notice he speaks about the, the chubs. That's interesting. <laughs> Ethiopia, Libya, Lydia, all the mingled people, chub. So there's this heavyset guy saying, man, why is God mad at me? And uh, he goes, uh, and the men of the lands who are allied shall fall with them by the sword. So basically, the first five verses speaks of that, the fact that God is bringing judgment. Moving on, verse 6. Thus says the Lord, those who uphold Egypt shall fall, and the pride of her power shall come down from Migdal to San. Those within her shall fall by the sword, says 
the Lord God. So in, in verse 6, those who, those who are, are um, upholding Egypt shall fall. But notice how it says, and the pride of her power. So they're going to discover the folly of trusting in the strength of man instead of trusting in God. Obviously, it's easier to trust in what you see than it is to trust in what you don't see. It's easier to trust in, in the arm of man because you can at least see that army. You can at least see that, that nation. You can see what it represents. So it's a lot easier to trust in what you see than to trust in what you don't see. You can see armies, but you don't see the Spirit of God. And what's interesting to me in all of that, and this is what the Lord is dealing with here. He's saying, those who uphold Egypt shall fall, and the pride of her power shall come down. He's saying, listen, you're trusting in what you can see. You Jewish people are thinking that Egypt is a nation mighty enough to deliver you from the hand of Babylon. But I'm letting you know that Babylon is going to take Egypt, and Egypt is falling into condemnation. Storm clouds are beginning to gather because judgment is about to fall. You've made a mistake, and the mistake you've made is you've trusted in that which your eye sees. You can see this, but you don't see my hand moving. God very often is simply working behind the scenes. You don't physically see him, but he's moving things to fulfill his will. And one of the things we as believers need to learn to do is to walk by faith and not by sight. We have a tendency of walking by sight. Seeing, we say, is believing. And that's something that many Americans say because that's a truism that many of us have held fasted for many years. But it's interesting how that in John's gospel in chapter 11, the Lord Jesus Christ had been asked to go and to minister to one of his friends, a man that we all know by the name of Lazarus. Lazarus had two sisters, Martha and Mary, and they had requested that the Lord Jesus come to minister to him because they said, the one whom you love is sick. And so Jesus remained where he was for a few days, didn't come, and then by the time he did come, Lazarus was already dead. And as he came and began to walk towards the town of, of Lazarus, and, and he was intercepted by Lazarus' sisters and all, they had said to him, he is dead. Jesus goes to the tomb, and, and this is what it says in John chapter 11, verses 39 and 40, and as he's standing there before the tomb, Jesus said, take away the stone. Now Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench, for he's been dead for four days. And so normally what would happen is because the, their embalming was, was a very basic thing, they would put spices and all in, in the body, uh, but it was sealed in a tomb, and because uh, Israel is, is very hot and all, uh, the body begins to decay, and within, within the fourth day there's the stench of death. And, and so because the, the, the tomb has been sealed, she's simply saying, if you open that up, the stench is going to waft out. He's been dead for four days. There are those who, who speak concerning the belief system of Jews, and, and during that time there were those who believed that the Spirit would hover by the body for three days. But by the fourth day, it would depart. And that's another reason why the number four would be used there when they say he's been dead for four days. In other words, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is totally dead. He is dead beyond a shadow of doubt. If we open up that tomb, if we roll away that, that, that stone that is closed against its entrance, then the stench of death is going to waft out. Now, the Lord Jesus had already made a statement. He had already said, I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me shall never perish. And he had asked the question, do you believe this? And so now, as the Lord is there standing before that tomb, and it's told to him he's been dead for four days, Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? And so the Lord would say, Believing is seeing, not seeing is believing. And so, in trusting in the arm of flesh, it's easier to trust in an army that you see than in the invisible living God. And so, every human ally, every human ally that they have, God is simply saying, will fail them. Every human ally that they have will fail them because God is saying, I am bringing judgment on Egypt. In Jeremiah 17, verse 5, thus says the Lord, Cursed is a man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. We have choices that we can make. We can trust in God or we can trust in man completely. But you can't trust completely in both. 
So it's always wise to trust in the one who never fails. Because no matter how much I might trust in somebody, there's always the possibility that they fail. Isaiah in chapter 31 verses 1 through 3 says, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses, who trust in chariots because they are many, and in horsemen because they're very strong, but who do not look to the Holy One of Israel, nor seek the Lord. Yet he also is wise and will bring disaster and will not call back his words, but will arise against the house of evildoers and against the help of those who work iniquity. Now the Egyptians are men and not God. Their horses are flesh and not spirit. When the Lord stretches out his hand, both he who helps will fall and he who is helped will fall down. They all will perish together. So God is simply saying, I'm bringing judgment. So those who uphold Egypt, he says, shall fall and the pride of her power shall come down. When it says from Migdal to Cyan, it's another way of saying from the north to the south, from all their borders, it's going to fall. Verse 7, they shall be desolate in the midst of the desolate countries, and her cities shall be in the midst of the cities that are laid waste. Then they will know that I am the Lord when I have set a fire in Egypt, and all her helpers are destroyed. The land of Egypt, he's saying, it will be laid waste. It's going to be devastated on all sides. Fire represents that which is all-consuming and irresistible. And God is simply saying, I am going to bring judgment. He says, when I have set a fire in Egypt. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, it says, our God is a consuming fire. And so the point is, judgment is coming, and it's coming from the Lord. Verse 9, on that day, messengers shall go forth from me in ships to make the careless Ethiopians afraid, and great anguish shall come upon them as on the day of Egypt, for indeed it is coming. You see, the Ethiopians were without fear because they were aligned with Egypt. But he's saying when Egypt is destroyed, Ethiopia will be caused to have fear. What's going to happen is the Egyptians are going to climb into ships and they're going to escape to Ethiopia and they're going to speak of what has taken place, which is going to cause the Ethiopians to have great fear. In verse 10, thus says the Lord God, I will also make a multitude of Egypt to cease by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He and his people with him, the most terrible of the nations, shall be brought to destroy the land. They shall draw their swords against Egypt and fill the land with the slain. I will make the rivers dry and sell the land into the hand of the wicked. I will make the land waste and all that is in it by the hand of aliens. I, the Lord, have spoken." He's saying, I am the one who is bringing this terrible judgment. When he speaks of drying up the river, it's another way of saying, I'm going to make the nation barren because you rely on the river and, its, and uh, the various little channels for everything. I'm going to make this land barren. God is saying, I am going to bring judgment. Verse 13, thus says the Lord God, I will also destroy the idols and cause the images to cease from Noph. There shall no longer be princes from the land of Egypt. I will put fear in the land of Egypt. I will make Pathros desolate, set fire to Zoan, and execute judgment in No. I will pour my fury on Sin, the strength of Egypt. I will cut off the multitude of No and set fire in Egypt. Sin shall have great pain. No shall be split open and Noph shall be in distress daily. The young men of Aven and Pibeset shall fall by the sword, and these cities shall go into captivity. We're all familiar with all of those cities. That doesn't require any explanation, right? Ezekiel is specifically pointing out major cities in Egypt that are going to be destroyed. Egypt was divided into two sections, lower and upper. And so the point he's making here is, I'm going to bring judgment on the entire nation. Now, what's interesting, and, and we could look at these, these cities, and they have other names that we're familiar with, and it's really not really worth trying to... I have notes to myself, the names that we would know them by, but it's really not worth it. It's simply a picture. But what I wanted to point something out, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you it in verse 13. I will also destroy the idols and cause the images to cease. Now, I want to say something real quickly about that. I already mentioned that they were idolaters. But as I was reading this, I found something very interesting, and, 
and I thought you might find this interesting. Uh, 1, verse 13 speaks of, I'll destroy the idols. Notice verse 17 when it speaks of um, and, uh, the word pi beset. The young men of Aven and pi beset shall fall by the sword. Pi beset. Um, that was the center, this is interesting to me anyway, of cat worship. Cat worship. The Egyptians had so many gods. They had major gods and minor gods. They had so many gods. One of the gods that had evolved in their, in their um, pantheon of gods was a particular god that was represented by the cat. Um, Bastet. And so that, the worship was centered in a place called Bai Baset. It was the center of cat worship. It is recorded that on a yearly basis, some 700,000 cat worshipers would show up. They even, they even mummified cats. They have found hundreds of thousands of mummified cats. I have a cat at my house that I'll donate. Uh, but <laughs> mummif mummified cats. Sometimes we don't realize how our religious beliefs actually trigger our behaviors. We don't, we don't really think about that very much, but it's true. And this worship of cats was actually used against them. There's a Persian king in history. His name was Kamsis. He ruled in 530 to 522 B.C., and he fought against the Egyptians, and he defeated them in front of their city. The city here is called Pibeset, but it was a, it was a center of, of their worship. Um, what he did is he captured a city called Pelusium by using a particular strategy. Seeing that the Egyptians regarded cats as sacred, and they would not injure a cat on any account, Kamses had his men carry the sacred animals, the cats, in front of them. So they came, his soldiers came walking in, marching in, carrying cats in their, uh, against them. They were holding these cats. And as they came walking in with the, the cats, the, the armies that were defending the city would not fire an arrow for fear of injuring their god. And so that's how he was able to take the city. They wouldn't shoot for fear of, of wounding the animal. And so they stormed this particular city successfully. Now, after he took the city, he uh, showed his contempt for the Egyptians by carrying a cage of cats in front of him upon his horse. And then he would grab cats and throw them at the people just to be contemptuous towards them and their belief that this cat was a sacred object the worship of these animals. Now, we say to ourselves, how backwards. When I was in, in India on one of the occasions I've been there, we went into one of the temples because we would, go and we would see what, what they did in those temples, and you can go into certain areas. We didn't go to worship in the temple. We went to observe what they were doing. And in front of this one particular temple, you have several children who are begging for food because they're starving. You see, this particular temple had been established for the worship of rats. And so you walk into the temple and you will see these worshipers taking handfuls of grain and throwing them into a particular area where the rats will come and feast on their offering. These kids are starving outside. But these worshipers go in there and feed rats. We've seen them do the same thing for their monkey god, where they go and feed the monkey god while they have children who are starving to death and are literally starving to death outside, right outside of the temple. There are quite a number of people throughout this world who worship animals and don't care about human beings. They don't care that much.
they get worried about certain kinds of endangered owls to this day. They won't build a dam that can, can hold water to irrigate crops because there's a darter fish that might be killed. It's just amazing. Now, they would say, I'm not an idolater. I'm just caring for nature. But when you start putting an animal as having more value than a human being, when you begin to do something like that, you're dangerously close to being an idolater. And so we, even here in the 21st century, continue to have this kind of problem. These people were idolaters. And God was saying, I'm going to deal with them. He already had in their history dealt with them. He had brought his plagues against the gods of Egypt. And he's saying now once again, he's saying, I'm going to destroy the idols. These people have infected the way my people think, and therefore I'm going to reduce them. I will destroy them. And that's exactly what the Lord is doing. You see, idolatry is senseless. In, in Romans chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, Paul said, Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. And so God says, I'm going to bring judgment on all these major cities because of the idolatry. Verse 18, at Ontario, the day shall also be darkened. <laughs> Tehophanes, I guess. When I break the yokes of Egypt there, and her arrogant strength shall cease in her. As for her, a cloud shall cover her, and her daughter shall go into captivity. Thus I will execute judgments on Egypt, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Now this particular city, Tehophanes, uh, was the uh, residence of the pharaohs. And so God is simply saying that the day will be darkened. Darkness symbolizes a calamity. And he's saying the arrogance of Egypt is about to be broken. It came to pass, verse 20, in the 11th year, the first month, seventh day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, I have broken the arm of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and see, it has not been bandaged for healing, nor a splint put on to bind it, to make it strong enough to hold a sword. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Surely I am against Pharaoh, king of Egypt. I will break his arms, both the strong one and the one that was broken, and I will make the sword fall out of his hand. I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them throughout the countries. I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon, put my sword in his hand, and I will break Pharaoh's arms. He will groan before him with the groaning of a mortally wounded man. Thus I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon, but the arms of Pharaoh shall fall down. They shall know that I am the Lord when I put my sword into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he stretches out it out against the land of Egypt. I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them throughout the countries. Then they shall know that I am the Lord." Eleven years after the deportation of Judah to Babylon, this takes place. God gives Ezekiel a message that, has, that he has taken power from Egypt through Nebuchadnezzar. Now, notice in verse 21 how he speaks about breaking the arm of Pharaoh. He had been broken by defeats that he had, and those defeats in terms of battles are recorded for us in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah 37 as well as 2 Kings chapter 24. But God is making it clear here that it was he and not man who had caused them to be defeated. And he's saying in verse 22, I'm against Pharaoh, king of Egypt. I'm the one who's going to break him. Not only will he not be able to use the arm that has been broken, but I'm going to break the one that remained healthy. In other words, you cannot go to him for help because he's going to be helpless to be of help to you. And I'm going to reduce Egypt to a shadow of what she once had been. Babylon, he's saying, is on the ascendancy. Babylon will overcome Egypt. And all of this is going to happen because God alone is sovereign over all affairs on the earth. I'll close with Isaiah 40, verses 28 through 31. Listen to what Isaiah says. God is saying here, I'm going to bring judgment I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations, disperse them. They shall know that I am the Lord. We need to know that God alone is sovereign. God alone is all-powerful. 
God alone is directing the affairs of man. We need to know that. As believers, we need to embrace the reality of a God who actually is concerned for us, who's aware of us, and who is on our side. Jesus made it very clear that he takes care of, of the birds of the air, and he says, and he'll take care of you too. He said, when you worry, that's a useless endeavor because by taking an anxious thought, you can't change the color of your hair from black to white. You can't gain height or reduce height through that. He said, it's really a useless endeavor, so the wisest thing you can do is trust in the Lord. He says to us that if we trust in the Lord, the Lord will provide for us in every way, shape, and form, but we need to understand that it's God who's on our side. When, when we understand that God is on our side, then we can ask, as Paul did, if God be for us, who can be against us? And so the thing that the Lord would have us to know is that he's the one who raises one kingdom and he brings the other one down. And if this one who can raise up the kingdom of Babylon to become the most powerful nation that the world has ever seen and reduce Egypt, a nation that was known for its glory and grandeur, if he can do that, then he can take care of us too. And Isaiah said it this way, Isaiah 40, verses 28 through 31. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. One of the young men in our fellowship and I were having a conversation recently, and he asked me a question. He says, Pastor, how did you, how did you grow in your faith to where you are right now? And I said, oh, that's an easy one. It took time. It took years. And I just woke up every morning saying, I want to be more like the Lord. That's all. It's no secret. There's no secret to growing in the Lord. It's, it's very simple. It's just make a decision every day. I want to wait on the Lord today. I want to see what God wants to do today. As you grow older, it, it becomes more of a habit in your life. When you're younger, you, you make those disciplined efforts. You, you, you wake up and you know you're going to be distracted by a variety of things, and so you start to make decisions, and, and you begin to think what is valuable and what is not. And, 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 and over the years, the Lord has removed some things that, that at one time were much too valuable to me and replaced them with things that really have a greater value. When I first got out of the Army back in 19... This was, this was 1973. When I had first got... I had gotten out of the Army and I was watching the NCAA's basketball tournament and UCLA was playing North Carolina State. And I was stationed in North Carolina for a year and a half and I had a friend of mine who was a North Carolina native and he told me that the only reason that UCLA had won the national championship in 72 is because North Carolina State had been declared ineligible. And uh, I, I, so being a UCLA Bruin fan and all of that basketball for many years, I thought, I don't like North Carolina and I don't like NC State. And so now they're playing for the championship. Well, actually it was, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, semis and ultimately they'd go into the championship. And UCLA was winning by eight points in overtime. And I thought, we got them. We ended up losing the game. And I can still, like we, like I was playing, right? Like I was sitting in my, <laughs> I was sitting there in my uniform waiting for the coach to call me in. You know, I'm ready, coach, to call me in. I was so mad. I was so mad. Walton, he was, Walton was the center. And he was a vegetarian. So right away I'm saying, that veggie man, I mean, if that guy would eat some meat, he'd have some strength. You know, I was mad. I was really mad. And I went and I turned the TV set off and I stormed out of the room. I was angry. We lost that game to North Carolina State. I was mad and slammed the door. And I went outside. My dad's looking at me. And, and you know, I'm, and, and it hit me. Why are you so mad? You didn't even go to that stupid school. 
What does it matter? And that's when I started thinking, you know, that's true. What does it matter? That's when I started to actually start thinking like that, but it didn't change me. I mean, I still had these things. Okay, I'm not that bad about basketball, but I love boxing. And Sugar Ray is fighting Roberto Duran. And I happen to like Roberto Duran. But I also like Sugar Ray. And they're both good fighters, but the fight's on Wednesday night. <laughs> Serious, I'm not lying. The church had just begun. And I told my worship minister, man, I want to see that fight. But it's on Wednesday night. His name was Doug, and Doug said to me, you're the pastor. You, you can change the Bible study one day, can't you? I said, you know what? That's the Lord. I recognize the voice of God when I hear it. So for that week, I changed this. The church was new. I changed the Bible study to to a Thursday, and I told him, I, you know, I mean, we only had 30 people. I said, listen, I want to see the fight. You guys know I'm a boxing fan. We're going to have Thursday night Bible study, but we're going to go over to Dave and Connie's and watch the fight. You want to be there? That's cool. <laughs> so we go and we watch the fight, and I am absolutely convicted by God because of that. See, that wasn't the first time that ever happened. Because the first fight they had, I was at my father-in-law's, and I was supposed to be teaching a Bible study, and I was late for the study because I really got into that boxing match. And somebody got up when I walked in. I said, listen, I'm late because I was watching a boxing match. And this young lady got up and walked away, and I never saw her again. She left, and the Lord said, you better get your priorities straight. Look what you're doing. But I didn't listen to him because a couple of years later, there we are watching another fight. And guess what? It has taken years for those things to die in me. Years. Years. Learning what my priorities are. At my age, walking with the Lord for as long as I have, sometimes people will ask that question, how did it come about that you have your priorities set? By making a lot of bad choices by making a lot of mistakes, by leading people wrong, by not being spiritual, by not seeking the kingdom of God first and his righteousness, by playing Christian and then reaping the consequences. And then slowly over time, because the Lord is so patient, he began to peel away things in my life where I began to honestly begin to think like I do now, which is, I enjoy sports. I can't play them anymore, but I like to watch them. But if I've got a, a basketball game, because I like the Lakers, if I've got a basketball game or a Bible study, which is the most important thing in your life. And I've gotten to the point where I really think the Bible study is. Now, there was a time when I said, well, it depends if it's a playoff, championship, I mean... <laughs> I can always get a guest speaker. <laughs> I'm telling you, I mean, I'm just being real with you. I'm going to edit all of this from the tape. <laughs> <laughs> Learning to wait on the Lord to renew your strength. Learning what matters, who's in control. And over the years, you come to realize that it's God who raises one up and brings the other down. Why does one person get used and another person not get used to the degree that this other person? Well, sometimes it's simply the sovereign choice of the Lord because he wants to do a work through this person in a special way, and that's just the way it's going to be. Other times, it's because this person is in the place to be used, and this other person is just simply not. When my, when my son Dave was playing Little League Baseball and he wasn't being put in the game, I used to tell him, sit on the bench, hold your glove, and be ready to go. Whenever the coach calls you, you're in the game. Just wait, because you'll get your chance. Just wait, but be ready. How did I learn that? High school baseball. 
they didn't put me in the game, so I went off and started playing Three Flies Up with a friend of mine. And uh, I'm out there playing, not even watching the game. And eventually, I was kicked off the team because I wasn't a team player. I learned a lot of lessons by being stupid, making dumb choices. And then I say, gosh, I wasn't a team player. I wasn't there ready to play. I should have been, and that's how I learned over the years, by making bad choices. It's not that difficult once you begin to think it through. So if I wait on the Lord, just waiting on Him, being ready, I'm going to renew my strength. I'm going to be made strong by the Lord and be usable by Him. And so when God is speaking to, to the nation of Egypt and He's speaking through Ezekiel, He's simply saying, listen, you Egyptians have a history of idolatry. And that idolatry that you have a history of is your demise. Because I'm bringing a nation called Babylon against you. You at one time were very glorious in your power, but Babylon is going to destroy you. Now, you Jews, don't be looking to Egypt for your help because you have the option. You can look to the hand of man or you can look to me. But if you want to see what I do to those whom you trust in, keep an eye on Egypt because I'm going to bring them down as I bring Babylon up. And so what do I learn from this? God says, I'm going to bring judgment against your idols. So what I learned from this is I want to make sure that I don't have idols in my life because God brings judgment against them. I want to learn to wait on Him and I want to see His hand, His sovereign work in my life so I can be blessed by God. Makes sense to me. The nation of Israel is said, is told, watch Egypt and see what I do to them. Learn your lessons. And that's what I really believe that I can do too by looking at a chapter here concerning judgment on Egypt. I see that God is holy, that God is righteous, that God judges idolatry, that God is one who raises one nation and puts the other one down. And I apply that to myself by saying, God, I don't want to live an unholy life. I don't want to make poor choices. I want to wait on you in order that you might renew my strength, that I might be used by you for your glory in these last days.